Okay, it looks like we are right at 5.30 and we do have a quorum. So if you would like, we will go ahead and get the meeting started. We'll start recording and I'll call your meeting to order. We will get moving. All right, uh, calling to order the Ward 1 Neighborhood Advisory Board for today, Monday, August 12th. Thank you for making it. A uh, few things that we need to do. I apologize going through details here. We need to make sure that we have um, all of the information at this time. You do not have a chair, so that will be an item that we will appoint later on. Um, I will call the roll. Uh, Piskovich? Here. Thank you. Wager? Absent at this time. Warning House? Thank you. I see that you're here. And Milligan? Hello. I'm here. Thank you. We do have a quorum of the Ward 1 NAB. And I will move on to your first item of the agenda, which is public comment. Members of the public may hear, observe, and provide public comment virtually by registering through the following link, which can be found at reno.gov forward slash meetings. That item is https colon forward slash forward slash links dot reno dot gov forward slash three t d k q r x. Comments heard under this item will be limited to three minutes per person and may pertain to matters both on and off the NAB agenda. The NAB may not take action on any matter not agendized on today's agenda. When you're called to speak for public comment, please state your name for the record and begin speaking. The timer will begin when you say your name and you'll be afforded three minutes. If you would like to make public comment, please raise your hand by using the raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom window. At this time, we will transition to approval of the agenda. I have no corrections or changes to the agenda at this time and would be looking for a motion. I didn't receive any documents, so I don't even have the last one. Okay, um, I, that's all right. I believe that we did send out the agenda. Uh, there were some supporting items. However, those will be present today as you go through the presentations. Uh, but we don't have further changes. There are three department business items today. There'll be an update quarterly from RPD, an update on neighborhood advisory board resolutions from city staff, and then INDOT will be doing a presentation. And then there is one development I ate in, in front of you today. It's fine. Okay. Can I get a second? I'll second that. Thank you. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Motion passes. And as a reminder, you can find the complete agenda packet online at reno.gov forward slash meetings. Um, with this, we will move on to the approval of the minutes. We're looking for approval of the May 13 minutes. Can I please get a motion? A motion to approve. Thank you. Looking for a second. Member Warning House, I feel like your hand is up from original, but if you're comfortable, we'll put you as a second. All those in favor? Aye. Thank Aye. you. Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Uh, next item before you today is appointment of a presiding officer. I apologize, I got out of order. At uh, this time, you have no chair or vice chair, so we would be looking for appointment of a presiding officer over your future meeting. I thought I was the vice chair. I'm not. I apologize. You are the vice chair. We have no chair at this time. That's what and I thought. Have, yeah, okay. chair has term has ended, so we would be looking for a new appointment of a chair. And if you move up, uh, Margot, then we would just need to appoint a vice chair. Well, somebody else can be chair if they'd like to. Is there a motion from any of the members to appoint one of you? Okay. 
is there literally just two of us on the call? <laughs> there, are, there are three of you. There are currently four on this board. Um, and there are three of you on here. Yes, I would volunteer, but I'm I'm not in a good place to, to volunteer for that at this point. So okay. otherwise I would speak up. Okay. Yeah, this is Carla Warninghouse too. I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble with the technical aspect of joining the chat, raising my hand and so forth here remotely. So uh, struggling a little bit. Um, let me ask um, if Margo is interested in being the chair. <laughs> I'm not dying to do this, let me, but I don't think it's that much longer, really, is it? It's just a few more meetings. That would be correct. If I could give a suggestion, one option would be we can continue this item. And then, Margo, if you'd like to run this meeting as the vice chair, you could take over that role and then we could bring back the presiding officer at another meeting. Okay, I can do that. Okay. If the group is comfortable with that, then we will put this item on a future agenda and circle back to it. And then with that, I will hand over the reins to you. The problem is I don't have any documents. Okay, mm -hmm. I will work to email you an agenda and I'll just keep running the items. How about that while we that work through it? That sounds fine, thank you. Okay, great. All right, next item in front of you is the council liaison report. Council member Ruckus. Thank you. Um, hello everyone. It's good to see and hear and be with you all. Um, I want to apologize for the uh, erratic nature of these meetings. I was, um, well, in May, I was traveling. You had a meeting. In June, the meeting was canceled by staff. I didn't even know it was canceled. Um, in July, we go dark. And then this meeting, staff decided to have it on Zoom only. Um, I didn't want it that way. James, I... I was excited that you were joining us and um, wanted to meet you in person. And I welcome you and thank you for stepping up to serve at this time. But um, this is the way that staff wanted to do it. And so um, they're the ones who run the IT department have the keys to the room. So that's how it went. Um, I want to, I'll just do a little bit of an update on some of the most current things going on relevant to the ward. Well, relevant to the city as a whole the city council is um, under uh, search again for a city manager. This will be the third city manager to come on since Hillary Sheevy has been mayor. mayor. Um, I term out after 12 years and the hiring will take place after I leave. So it'll be up for others to make those decisions, but it's a long process the council adopted. So that's going on. Um, you maybe have heard or maybe even you know reached out yourself um, if you're a business license um, holder, so um, accepted a recommendation to um, make some cleanup to our business licensing um, ordinances, modernization, and a very large document was produced by their consultant. And um, this caused a lot of um, consternation out in the public. I spent a lot of last week fielding comments from folks on that. Um, and so, uh, have a chance to be updated on it by staff, but have done a special review of it, in particular in light of the people who have talked to me. And um, we'll just see what the next steps are. But I am listening to people and I do share your concern. I, I was outlining a different approach rather than just have a code written, wanted to go through a, a planning process of for each business category, identify the issues, you know, what are the problems? What are we trying to solve? And we never quite got it there. So now we have a draft, which is very hard to understand from a draft, you know, what you're trying to do. So um, what problems you're trying to solve, because there isn't any narrative on ordinance. Um, so I just want to let people know that I'm working on that. Um, I feel to know. of the Glow Plaza. Mr. Jacobs has demolished um, a lot of residential units around the Glow Plaza. So those folks have been no longer um, there, no longer in that housing, uh, who I heard from on the earlier years. But I've been hearing from folks on some of the other spots this year and some of the special events too. I know we just did hot August nights, um, but some of the other special events, particularly the Wingfield ones, been hearing from residents 
up around that kind of Wingfield River corridor about some of those. Um, there's been some good ones, but there's also been some um, problems of trash left over, noise, and that sort of thing. Uh, the church churches, I usually hear from the churches, but I haven't heard from them. Well, I've heard from one, but usually it's more Sunday activity, but the trash has been a big problem. And I've let our act, acting interim city manager know um, and try and do a weekend review on myself on Mondays to see what the trash cl closing um, trash situation is mm -hmm. down there. Because uh, we do want to hold this special event for profits, usually special event uh, operators accountable for doing what their permits outline. And also make sure their permits are fair to our residents. If residents are going to be displaced from a weekend from a public park on a prime summer weekend, um, we want to make sure that that bridge or that park is open in good Monday when residents can return to their public spaces. Um, tomorrow at three is going to be the Arlington to, um, uh, bridge um, kickoff um, at 3 p.m. tomorrow. If you're inclined to head on down there, it should be nice. I think the smoke will clear out by then, hoping. And I'm hoping... Um, Maybe in some of the next meetings, we can talk about the status of the Boo Street and the Keystone Avenue Bridge, because they're, the, they're in the next ones to come online. I think Keystone is under design, so you won't be seeing a river, um, you know, an opening anytime soon on that one. And, oh, and the redevelopment agency um, is is get getting back active again. It's been, it's been just a debtor agency for the last 10 years. But um, it's starting to come back to life and it does encompass a fair amount of Ward 1, um, which, you know, I know is changing to Ward 2 here pretty soon. Um, but just would encourage people to, um, if you're interested in the tool of redevelopment, um, you might want to uh, watch some of those, the council meetings, because it, it does involve choices about how resources and tax money is spent, um, you know, ostensibly to... Um, advance certain neighborhoods. And one of the neighborhoods that it should be advancing is the historic area of Ward 1. Um, but there's a lot of ways it can it can be used also, given to private entities, used for public facilities, that sort of thing. But it should all, all those decisions have to be made outlined per state law and, and according to a plan too. And those are the conversations the council is starting to have and that's about all I have for update. We have a Wednesday meeting um, and then we'll meet again um, uh, later too. Uh, any questions for me, anyone? Do we have, I can't tell who's on the public. Do we have any public on? Councilmember, we do have public. Um, if any of them have questions, they're welcome to raise their hand at this time. I can't see who, how many, like usually you can see how many people you have on in the public. Correct. You have, there, there oh, are participants. No. Okay. Yeah. 17 participant, participants. Oh, okay. I see. Well, uh, attendees. Yeah. Panelists. Attendees, correct. So attendees would be the public. Some of these okay. are. Okay. Okay. So we do. People. Yeah. Because Ward 1, Ward 1, and I, that was part of the thing is Ward 1 has always been so well attended with folks wanting to come. So, uh, you know, and participate in person. Um, so um, it's always, you know, we haven't done a virtual meeting since COVID. So I just wanted to um, recognize if there are any residents, we often do this very free flowing and people are given the chance to ask questions too. So now I see that there are participants on. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your update council member. Uh, Madam Vice Chair, moving on to our next item is staff liaison report. I don't have any updates for this body at this time. So we would be transitioning to item B1, which is the quarterly update. Found it. Thank, Thank you. Thank oh, you. I have a question for staff update. Mm -hmm. I just noticed that, um, and I wasn't informed about it, that on the Ward 1 page, right next to my photo, <laughs> it says that the Ward 1 NAB will be hearing um, emergency and uh, other uh, matters each month. Um, when did that go into effect? I, I don't know. I hadn't noticed that or been informed of that. It, do you have a staff update on that? I do not, but I will look into it and report back. Yeah. You know, while we're talking about this, the next time we meet, I hope, I, I guess that would be 
in September. Could we do this in person? Because this is just not working for me. Yep, we appreciate the feedback from the the group. Uh, there were some staffing constraints, so that's part of why this meeting was held virtually. Uh, and again, we reached out to the members beforehand, but we've received your feedback and we appreciate it and we'll do the best that we can next month. Okay, I would appreciate yeah. that. It, it seems that we're not getting the input that we generally get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's nothing better than being with people. Correct. <laughs> It's really important. Yeah, I agree with you. Yep, we'll do the best that we can next month. Well, let's just make it work. I see that we do have public comment from Emily Montan. Emily, if you'd like to speak at this time, you should be unmuted. Looks like you're remuted. There we go. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Floor is yours. Excellent. Good evening, folks. Um, I'd like to say that I'm a and that I appreciate having the option of going online because I'm I, I'm dealing with an illness, so sometimes going out is impossible for me. So maybe we could do hybrid. So, so the folks who don't like technology can meet in person and the folks like us who rely on technology because we're semi homebound or homebound can participate. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. All right, Madam Vice Chair, transitioning over to you. Your next item is the quarterly update from Reno Police Department. We do have uh, Captain Larson here today to do this quarter's presentation. Great, thank you. Well, good evening and thank you for having me today. Um, so looking over the numbers, and I think they're pretty average. Um, I won't go over each line with you unless you have uh, specific questions. But from May to June, as we see the summer months come in, we typically see a small uptick um, in crimes across the board. Mostly that's due just to people getting in that warmer weather. You get more people out. There's more crimes of opportunity um, is what ticks that up. I did talk with our crime analysts. And as the summer goes on, you do see to start to see that tick go down. And she said for the next months, you will start to see that tech tick come down in, in the numbers. Um, other than that, um, big news for us is this Thursday, we're doing our grand opening of the new public safety center. Uh, so that's going to be super exciting. We have people actually moving in uh, this week. We're going to have officers, uh, some certain units that are going to be actually working out of the building. Um, so for me, as a 26-year cop, it's always been 18 months, 18 months, we're going to get a new building. So this is the longest 26-year, 18-month uh, that I've experienced, but I'm very happy. Uh, the city did a tremendous job in getting this building for us. It's beautiful. I think the officers are really going to like it. There's a lot of positivity um that this move is being made and we're just thrilled to death about moving into this new building um the other big news we had is over the last um six months we had matrix consulting group come in and do a staffing study something that we haven't done internally for quite some time to see how our deployment is uh, whether we're meeting the needs of the of the certain communities how we can de deploy better uh, what do our numbers look like? Um, do we need more cops? So we're just getting that in. We're taking that um, study and reviewing it. But what we are going to do is we're already looking at the staffing plan that they uh, suggested for us. So we are going to put that into play for this bid. Um, we change staffing twice a year. Um, so we're going to do that again in October. So we are going to take um, that matrix study and employ that staffing model um, to see if we can... Um, deploy more economically uh, and be more efficient with our, our resources across town and, and, uh, and make a difference. Um, those are kind of my big topics um, that I had. I'm certainly open for questions if, if you have any out there. I have a couple of questions. <laughs> um, I realize you said it always goes up in the summer because there's more opportunity. Yes, um, it, it looks like to me though that um, we're much higher. Is that just because of new people moving in? that we were in 2023 is a total and some of the numbers are pretty similar, but seems like we're up a little bit. Yeah. I mean, we are up a little bit. 
The other thing we're doing in 2023, um, late 2022, is we transitioned away from the, the standard um, UCR reporting system and we moved to the NIBRS reporting system. The unfortunate side of that move is not all numbers were apples to apples. There is a ton of apples to oranges. So when we when the government split out burglary into a bunch of different realms, we're trying to take the pieces and make them as coordinated as we can. It's just unfortunately we can't quite get them. So that is one of the downfalls um, with the system. It's the NIBRS in the long term is going to be a much more accurate system. Um, but in this transition, we're going to lose a little bit of um meaning to the numbers because they just don't quite correlate the same way as they did in the past. So you should see that um, a much better product next year once we have once we can start comparing um, apples to apples again. So this is just kind of a, I mean, I, what is it? I mean, is it just, that's, I mean, I, I'm not following. I mean, we have a new problem. I mean, it looks like to me that the numbers are like destruction of properties 41 to 35. I mean, uh, just, yes, ma'am. I mean, absolutely. I mean, you're looking at so in May of 24 and June of 24, you were absolutely on the same nibers. And yes, that's just those crimes of opportunity that that I was mentioning. When the kids get out of school, um, they've got that free time on their hand. The parents are allowing them to go out and, and do some things. And unfortunately, um, that's typically what we see in the in the summer times is that destruction of property. Um, however, um, you can see too that we've got. Uh, um, the burglary went up a little bit and uh, some of the other things. So, yeah, um, just more people in town. Absolutely. That has to do with it. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'd have to dig more into the numbers and really to see what what they were about. But the, um, like I said, typically in the summertime, you just get those crimes of opportunity, warm weather. People come out more drinking in the summer, which leads to arguments. Um, and then people leave their doors open right? Because they're trying to get that that air into their house. Um, so that's what I'm talking about with crimes of opportunity. We typically see burglary go up because it's just easier for criminals to enter into the residence. But you nailed it, Margo. You, you're right there. I, this is Jim uh, or James, but Jim, whatever. Uh, I just had a question just based on what I've read in the paper. I don't know how accurate it is, but with the HOPES program and the homeless facility or unhoused uh, facility that we have at the Governor's Ball, which is fantastic. Um, are we seeing people coming in out of the area, bringing in their unhoused populations and dumping them in Reno? And if so, is, is that increasing the crime rate? Um, our, our unsheltered population absolutely has an effect on the crime rate. I'm not sure, to be honest with you, Jim, if um, we're seeing a lot more um, out of town people coming in to use our facility. Um, since Washoe County does run that now, um, I just don't have the access we, we once did to the numbers, but I can certainly um, have that looked into and get those numbers back to you um, to see where where the un, unhoused people are coming from. Yeah, that, that'd be an interesting statistic. And then okay. and, and another thing, just, I'm new to all this, so excuse me if I'm as, asking a dumb question, but um, I see that these are just straight numbers, right? So population numbers would affect it. So per capita or percentage of the population, um, the, the more people that are there, obviously, the probably the higher the number is going to be. Um, is there any way to correlate the population size with these metrics? So you can put them in perspective, um, right? Because the more people that are living there, the higher the number I would think would be, and the lower the population, the lower the number I would think would be. But no, anyway. that, that, Jim, you're, you're absolutely correct. The more people you put in a certain area, the more um, crimes of opportunity, the more crime we have. Um, absolutely, there's a correlation. A few years back, we looked at um, the various NABs were asking for um, a bunch of, of different stats. So we sat down with them and we met to come up with a uh, consolidated version so that our crime analysts could just do everything the same, make it a little, give them some more time to actually work on um, some of the crime trends that they were working on. Um, I can certainly bring that forward and see if we can do uh, a correlation number to that. Um, I don't know what would be involved in it, but it doesn't seem like it'd be too difficult to, 
to see a, a population percentage based crime stat added. Yep. I have a quick question for you also. Um, I don't know how to exactly frame this question, but for example, I'm just going to pick one of these like burglary 60. Do we uh, know what area of Ward 1 that's in or is it just scattered throughout? I mean, is there um, one area that's more has more issues than others? Yeah, just looking at the map um, that was provided, it looks like it's going to be more in that Second Street Marsh area, kind of those outer fringes of the downtown, and then also down around um, Lakeside and Yori. Um, those seem to be the two hot spots. Just taking a quick a quick look, um, that west and the old southwest seems, to, you know, um, not be not be catching that burglary. And that's that's typical to to Margo because more populated areas. Sure. Uh, again, we're right back to that. You know, people leaving their doors open, uh, more people walking by the residence and seeing that opportunity. Yeah, and I, and when I just saw the map, and it, it does make sense where there's more more contact. Yeah. Some of these numbers seem to be higher actually in May than in June, which if it were warm weather, doesn't really quite make sense. And as far as the population, I mean, sure, the more people there are, the more crime, but I don't know how much, how, how big a percentage change was there in Reno's population in one year? I mean, I don't know it's enough to explain a 25% increase in something. Maybe the population went up a couple of percent or so, but it's not, it's not, it's like a 25% increase. Well, I, That's I was under, a 25. I was under the impression with the, the new districts that they're all pretty much even, like around 44,000 people or something like that. Yeah, um, maybe Councilwoman Breakfast would have a better understanding on that. Um, but I, I agree with you, Margo. I believe they were designed to be uh, fairly even. Yeah, but these are the, yeah, that's true. These are the ones that reflect the 2010 population, um, or 20, excuse me, 2020. So they are fresh. Um, so I, I, I did. These aren't current? The population right no now. no it is an equal among among wards yeah i was thinking because i followed that and i thought it was about forty four thousand per ward yeah let's ask um captain larson about the gateway in i am not familiar about with that one um councilman breakfast give me a little more on it and maybe it will spark something for me i think or maybe i got the not Name room. It's on the west side of Virginia Street. We've talked about it at our NAVs before. Um, it's on Virginia Street, Gateway and Gentry or so. It's a motor lodge in. I'm just not. Leases. Not as familiar. you actively do about some operations there. We had the. Does it ring? No. Does it ring a bell? No, the only one I can think of, Miss Breckus, is is down. We're doing a lot of stuff down at the Vagabond, but that's outside of your ward. Area. Oh, I'm sorry, it's the Vagabond. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I mean yeah. we're doing what, a lot what, of stuff what, with Alex and code enforcement down at the Vagabond. Um, it's historically been a a place of um, how do I say it? Ill repute, maybe. <laughs> we have a lot of people that go down there. A lot of drug sales, uh, human trafficking. So we've sent in our special units to to try to do it along working with code compliance. Um, we're having some success. I know they are closing rooms down um, uh, when we do get in there. And I believe the um, Alex is going after um, some business licensing, um, but it's a, it's a lengthy process, right? For Alex to do that stuff. So we'll, we keep working with Alex um, to try to keep things quiet while he's working through his process. Okay, well, it's been a central focus to the constituents in that corridor. Okay, Thank yeah, you. We're, we're working on it actively, yes. Any other comments or questions? I guess we can say thank you. No, thank you, I appreciate it. Keep me on my toes.
All right, Madam Vice Chair, moving on to your next item. This is a Neighborhood Advisory Board resolution update from staff. Hi, everyone. This is Jenica Finnegan, uh, Council Relations Manager. Um, excited to be here tonight to brief you on the proposed update for the NAB resolution. Uh, so next slide, please. Oh, can we go to the, oh, there we go. Thank you. So here's just a little bit of history um, on NABs. Uh, they first came about in 1994. There have been a few updates uh, since then. Um, council adopted the ordinance to create a six ward uh, September of last year. So I'm looking to bring this um, to each NAB in August and then ultimately to council um, for adoption or consideration in September uh, ahead of the new ward boundaries going into effect. Next slide, please. The new ward boundaries I thought had gone into effect. For the purposes of the election. Um, they have, mm -hmm. but not for the wards. Correct. Okay, After, thank you. Yeah, sure. So the main um, purpose uh, for this update to the resolution is to make sure that each ward has a NAB. Um, and is represented uh, by a NAB. So these are the changes as they relate to the Ward 6. So the first one is making sure that the resolution uh, goes into effect at the same time as the new Ward boundaries. Uh, the second one there is creating the 6th Ward uh, NAB. The third one is updating the uh, map that corresponds to the resolution. The last one there is the impact uh, of the 6 wards on the NABs and uh, clarifying term limits, eligibility, and a transition plan for sitting members. So at this time, staff is recommending that sitting NAB members would remain on their current NAB and would be allowed to serve out the remainder of their current terms if they chose. Uh, and then members whose wards have changed due to the, the redistricting process uh, can serve on a different NAB uh, if they resign from their current NAB and then apply through the normal process. So if we take a look at the next slide, we can walk through those different scenarios. So new ward boundaries go into effect and I'm on the, I'll start on the left side there. Uh, if you live in a different ward, you have two choices. Uh, keeping to the left, I want to serve on a different NAB. What you would do is submit your resignation to the current NAB and then apply to serve on the desired NAB. Uh, the next one, if you live in a different ward and want to continue to serve on your current NAB, you're eligible to continue to serve on your NAB uh, for the remainder of your term. And then on the right side, uh, if you live in the same ward, uh, nothing changes, you're eligible to continue serving on your current NAB for the remainder of your term. Next slide, please. I think we lost you a little bit. Oh. It's hard to, it, I th you cut out at one point. Could you go back to that last slide? Sure. Can, can, can you put yourself on camera so we can hear, see you talking too? <laughs> are, are you able to do that? I, I kind of lost you. There, thank you. Is that better? Okay, yeah, so mm -hmm. I think it was the slide. Sorry? The mm -hmm. slide prior. Okay. With the with the schedule, with the high, yeah. I, it, it might have been, my, my, <laughs> I've been getting uh, energy outlet outages all day mm -hmm. from NB Energy and then apologies for an energy outage. So I know, I'm sure other people are having the same problem today. Could you go over this slide again? Sure. So that first one is just the effective date of the resolution. So that ensures that the, the updated Neighborhood Advisory Board resolution would go into effect at the same time as the new ward boundaries. And then the second one, the creation of a, a Ward 6 NAB that just uh, adds a six ward into the resolution. The third one is updating the ward map uh, to include the updated ward map in the resolution and reflect that six ward. The third one is the impact of the transition to six wards on the NABs, uh, specifically as it relates to NAB currently sitting NAB members. Uh, and so the next slide goes into more detail about what that looks like. So the new ward boundaries go into effect and I stayed to the left first. Uh, if you live in a different ward and want to serve on a different NAB, you can submit a resignation to your current NAB and then apply uh, to serve on the desired NAB. 
Okay. And then if you live in a different ward, but would like to continue serving on the NAB, despite being redistricted into a different ward, um, you're eligible to do that. Uh, as a reminder, all the NAB members do serve at the pleasure of the of the council member and council members would remain uh, the ability to remove any NAB member at any time for any reason. Uh, and then the last scenario is that you live in the same ward, nothing changes for you, you're eligible to continue serving on your current NAB for the remainder of your term. Did that clarify for you, Council Member Brickus? Actually, you said something I didn't recall, and they serve at the um, discretion of the council member, and we can just remove them for mm -hmm. no reason. I, I don't recall that being a circumstance. Is that in resolution as it reads right now? It is. Okay. I can highlight that section for you uh, and uh, send over the current resolution. Okay, thank you. I've never been aware of that, um, but okay, thank you. Okay. All right, next slide. Okay, so these are some functional changes um, that we that staff is also recommending. So that first one is regarding eligibility requirements. Uh, this clarifies some ambiguous language in the current resolution um, and adds language regarding um, service on multiple boards. So staff is recommending that um, while you may want to serve on a neighborhood advisory board and another city board, uh, we would not have uh, one person serving on two neighborhood advisory boards. So you could serve on a NAB and Parks and Rec, but you couldn't serve on Ward 1 and Ward 2 NAB, for example. Uh, alternate member provisions, this just clarifies some language. Um, alternates would go to council um, in order to become a full member. The third one is an absence removal clause. This ensures that um, NABs are able to meet regularly and meet forum have committed and active members. Uh, and so staff is recommending that if there's a essentially a no call, no show, three meetings in a row, that that um, NAB member may be you know, removed from the body. Um, applicability of RMC 2.20. This is um, clarifying the applicability of our code of ethics uh, to NAB members as public appointees. And then the last one here is presiding officer selection. Um, as we kind of saw at the beginning of this meeting, uh, to create consistency across all of the NABs, we would recommend uh, adding language to, to um, select a chair and vice chair at the first regularly scheduled meeting of the year. Next slide, please. And then as we dove into the NAB resolution, there were uh, a few other things uh, that we took a look at in uh, recommending cleanup. So those include removing gendered language from the resolution, uh, combining provisions related to the development of, uh, or excuse me, related to development projects. This is in three different sections. So just creating topical uh, sections for this resolution to follow. Uh, clarifying language related to term limits, clarifying resignation protocol, that would just be submitting a written email uh, to the staff liaison, uh, clarifying that service on the NAB is uncompensated. We, we took a lot of these from other NABs, uh, excuse me, other boards and commissions across the city as well. Uh, that one, I believe, is from the HRC. Uh, outlining the duties of the chair and the vice chair's presiding officers, this is from council rules. Uh, clarifying agenda creation process, and then adding legal disclaimers. Last slide is just my contact information and ways for you all to give feedback uh, on the resolution. Uh, you should have that in your email. If not, it'll be uploaded with the packet, the draft resolution. And there is my contact information as well if you have any questions. Yeah, can you, this is Carla Warninghouse. Can you hear me? I have a question for you. Yes. So um, this has been a, a something that has bothered me um, both uh, on the NAB and, and uh, parks too. Um, you know, our anytime we serve in any sort of position, we are it, it's public knowledge, right? So our our names and and all are you know are out there for the public. 
but so is a fair amount of personal contact information, like our addresses, phone numbers, all of that as well. And that's always been something of concern to me. Is this something that is going to continue? Is this a, like a, the, a city attorney issue or is this something that's, um, that is just up to, to the NABs or the council or, or what? Yeah, all of our board, oh, sorry, Ms. Turney. <laughs> Want to jump in? No, nope, you're welcome to answer, and I can fill in blanks if you, if you would like. Uh, it's it's my understanding that this is um, as, as a public appointee that information is publicly available for across all of our boards and commissions. So, Carla, uh, Jenica is correct. Ashley Turney, Assistant City Manager, for the record, uh, to also add more color to that, there is an opinion from the Attorney General's Office that states that anyone who is to be appointed to a public board or position their name has to be listed on an agenda and in compliance with open meeting law, that information is part of our public process. Uh, the alternative option you would have there is if you have a confidential address as is granted by a court, that is something that you could submit that information to the clerk to have your information withheld from the application if you have that granted by a judge. Uh, but otherwise it is part of the open meeting law process and packet. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. I can just tell you that that, uh, that alone is enough to make me um, consider not being on any of these boards or anything anymore. I mean, people are people are a little crazy these days and uh, having a name out there is one thing. Having your home address publicly available is is an issue. Just, just for your information, it's pretty easy to get anybody's address. It's everywhere. So, I, you know, hopefully, you I know. know. You can go to the assessor's office. You can go to the recorder's office. You can go anywhere. Go to you can. It takes takes a little more effort though than just going online and finding it. I mean, it's, it's well, it's everywhere online. That's what I'm saying. Whether we like it or not. All right. Are there any other NAP questions that I can answer? I don't think so. Um, I, I had. I'm oh. sorry. This is this is Jim Elliott. I had one question on the on the flow chart where it says I'm going to remain on the NAB even though my NAB has changed. I know it didn't state it that way, but that's the point. Mm -hmm. I just thought, and I and I decide to continue serving in a NAB that will no longer be my NAB. But say I don't know, six months goes past, and I'm like, this really doesn't make any sense. Or you, we just follow the other process and resign and then reapply. Or once you're in, you're. Is there going to be like a a point of no return, I guess, when this transition occurs. You are welcome to continue serving. Um, if you decide at any time, you're always welcome to submit your, your resignation email to the staff liaison and then uh, fill out another application for the appropriate ward that you feel okay. represents you. Makes perfect sense. Thank you very much. Of course. All right. And if there are no further questions, Madam Vice Chair, we'll move on to the next item for the NAB tonight, which is a presentation from INDOT, Nevada Department of Transportation on I-80 West Reno Landscaping and Aesthetics Overview. Great. We have presenters are joining as panelists right now and are transitioning over from the public space you will see various folks and INDOT representatives. As you come on over, feel free to unmute and you can start presenting. Just let us know when you need to go to your next slide and we'll advance the slides for you. And good evening, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, you can just state your name for the record. That way we uh, can ensure it's on the minutes. We appreciate it. Sure. Yeah, my name is uh, Aaron Lobato. I am the project coordinator overseeing the design aspect of this uh, roadway widening project. And uh, my role is I can be, be, I will be providing a brief overview of the scope, and then I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Matthew Parker, who will be presenting on the landscape, landscape and aesthetics portion of this project. Um, just to give a brief overview, this project location is located on the west side of Reno on I-80 and is starting at the McCarran Interchange and heads east towards uh, Keystone Avenue. Uh, the project scope, the primary, the primary scope of this project is to add a dedicated lane for the traffic entering at the McCarran Interchange and traveling east towards Keystone Avenue. 
Um, to achieve this, uh, we will be shifting the existing two lanes towards the center median to create sufficient space for the new auxiliary lane, um, effectively creating three lanes in the eastbound direction. In addition to the widening, uh, we will be constructing sound walls to provide a little relief for the residents uh, living near the section of the corridor. Um, we will also be widening the Stoker Bridge in order to accommodate the third lane. Um, this project also includes uh, rehabilitating four structures. This includes the McCarran, Stoker, Keystone, and the Cemetery Bridge. Um, we are also going to be doing some lighting upgrades along the corridor, minor hydraulic improvements as a result of the widening, um, signage updates, and uh, landscape uh, and aesthetics improvements, which Matt will elaborate on shortly. Um, the most recent project updates is um, we had our transportation board meeting today and a notice of intent to award was um, letter was sent to the contractor, which is RHB. And if all goes well, we should anticipate construction to begin sometime mid to late September of this year. So with that, thank you for your time and I'll hand it over to Matt. Thank you, Aaron. Can uh, everyone hear me all right? Yes. Yep. Great. Thank you. Uh, my name is Matthew Parker. I'm the landscape architect with Nevada Department of Transportation. And tonight I'll be presenting uh, the proposed landscape and aesthetic improvements along uh, Interstate 80 between Keystone and McCarran. Um, I, uh, I there will be some time for Q and A after my short presentation here. So if you have any questions, feel free to hold on them till the end. Next slide. So a little bit of background about our program uh, in early 2000. The uh, state, advise, uh, state transportation board uh, wanted to develop a master plan to provide some guidance and standards and policies regarding the aesthetics of our highway system. And uh, with collaboration and oversight from a citizen advisory board, we came up with a, a master plan in 2002. And using that as a foundation, we then proceed to launch off into a series of corridor studies um, in collaboration with stakeholders and local government agencies to uh, provide a series of corridor plans that, that provide us with a more in-depth and detailed um, design guidance for uh, the various highway corridors in our state. And using both the master plan and our corridor plans um, to direct us further into design of the various projects we have and like the one I'm um, gonna be presenting right now. Um, we had a stakeholder meeting in 2021 and public outreach last year in 2023. And so right now we stand kind of in between steps three and four, as Aaron mentioned, going into construction uh, later on this year. Next slide. So uh, this is just a little bird's eye view of the project limits uh, there in purple. So uh, the Western boundary is McCarran Boulevard with Keystone Avenue serving as the eastern boundary. And everything you see it's purple is where we're gonna be making some landscape improvements. Next slide. So any of you who've driven along the I-80, you certainly noticed there's kind of this recurring theme of flora and fauna. Uh, this was a theme agreed upon uh, many years ago through various uh, public outreach efforts. And it's definitely one we want to carry on into this project as well to provide some continuity and consistency with the rest of the I-80 corridor. Um, pay note to those fish there in the bottom as we coming up again soon here. Uh, go ahead and let's go to the next slide. And one of the other ways that we provide that continuity is with the colors. So these colors are from our corridor plan for uh, I-80. And um, you may notice some of the uh, existing bridges along ID already have a lot of these same colors, so we'll be bringing these in as well, and uh, it just brings a little little harmony and consistency uh, when when everything's kind of the same color. So that's something that will be included in this project as well. Next slide. So here's a little sample of of some of the plant material we'll be using in part of this project. This doesn't consist of all the plant material. There's a lot of species not included here. I just wanted to provide a sample to give you some of the flavor of what we plan to put out there. Uh, we have a lot of species that are flowering, species that are deciduous, changing colors uh, in fall. Uh, but then we also have evergreens to serve as like a, a backbone of color and texture the last year round. So at the end of the day, we have a dynamic landscape that changes with the seasons, but come wintertime, it's not just gonna be a bunch of sticks in the snow. We'll also have a lot of evergreens to 
uh, provide color and texture. Next slide. So I'm going to break down uh, an overview of what we're doing into three parts. Um, the intersections of McCarran and Keystone, and then that blue section of uh, corridor in between the two intersections. Next slide. So starting with McCarran, I'm sure a lot of you have probably noticed some of the things I want to mention here. We've got we got old paint, uh, stained paint. There's a lot of barren patches in the landscape. Um, some of the trees are dying, if not already dead. And we've got erosion. A lot of the dirt is sloughing off uh, those slopes onto the sidewalk and the streets. So the solutions to solve these issues is we're going to be repainting the, the bridge and slope paving, repairing and updating the irrigation system, we'll be removing dead and dying plant material, installing new trees and shrubs, and installing some decorative rock to ensure that the erosion stops and we don't have dirt spilling into the sidewalks and streets anymore. Next slide. And then bringing that flora and fauna theme in. So uh, and at this particular intersection, uh, we chose the Western Fence Lizard. And uh, that's going to be displayed via uh, steel cut image panels that are powder coated to color. And they will be attached to the slope paving underneath the bridge. Uh, right now, that, that, uh, that rendering you're seeing on the top left hand corner, we were originally going to sandblast the lizards in. Um, it was later determined that it would be a, a better option to actually use steel panels that we then attach to the concrete. Next slide. The Keystone intersection, intersection has a lot of the same issues at McCarran. Uh, we've got old paint, we've got barren patches of landscape, and we've also got erosion issues. So it's going to be the same solutions there as well. Repainting the bridge and retaining walls, repairing and updating the irrigation system, removing dead and dying plant material, installing new trees and shrubs, and then installing decorative rock to control that erosion. Next slide. And the flora and fauna element at this intersection is going to be the black-tailed jackrabbit. Following the same approach we're doing at McCarran, where we're going to have steel-cut image panels of the rabbit and various gestures that are commonly seen uh, along the trails here, maybe even some of your neighborhoods. Uh, they'll be powder-coated the color, and then um, behind the jackrabbit, we'll be painting in blades of grass on those repainted walls. Uh, you may notice here we, a lot of those colors I showed you earlier, the color palette are being represented here to, again, bring those quarter colors throughout this project. Next slide. Now between McCarran and Keystone, it's a little bit of a different situation. As Aaron had mentioned, we're, we're installing sound walls. And because we have uh, very little room to work with on either side of the highway, um, the construction of the sound walls is going to impact a lot of the existing uh, trees and, and rock out there and, and the irrigation system as well. So uh, as part of building these sound walls, we're going to be mitigating for those impacts, bringing in new rock and new trees and uh, redesigning the irrigation system around the walls. So uh, when all said and done, we'll not only have the new sound walls, but um, new plant material and, and new rock as well. And it's a good point to bring up that uh, generally speaking on these construction projects, we have a lot of um, tree. It's, it's very common for trees to be one of the first things that come out. And then one of the last things to go in at the end of the day, because when they're doing construction, they don't want to be working around new trees. So uh, it should be um, communicated to the public that you should expect a lot of tree removal in the beginning. And then throughout the construction process, um, the trees will be coming in towards the end. So don't panic if you see a lot of trees coming out and nothing being replaced right away. There is going to be a little bit of a delay between uh, the mitigation of, of putting in new trees. Next slide. And then these uh, new sound walls going in, we the flora and fauna theme we're bringing in uh, is uh, fish swimming through the Truckee River. Uh, the fish you may uh, re recall might look a little familiar. We, we use them further east down in the Sparks area uh, where they are represented through image panels attached to retaining walls. In this case, those, those same fish are uh, going to be represented in these patterns, as well as some abstract patterns of these ribbons to represent the high flow of the Truckee River and uh, these ripple effects, which uh, during these very calm parts of the Truckee River, you know, you get fish biting and bugs landing, you get these really cool ripple effects. So those abstract patterns both represent the, the uh, different water conditions of the Truckee River, but they also serve uh, an additional purpose in that they hide these wall transitions. You may see there in that elevation, the wall kind of uh, jacks up in the middle there. And when this wall is built 
it's going to be um, sh these panels are going to be shifting up and down as needed to meet the different grades along the side of the road. And uh, by keeping these patterns abstract, it, it, it hides these transitions. They aren't as noticeable, uh, but we still get a chance to communicate a theme um, while at the same time having a lot of flexibility when uh, constructing the wall panels. So it's an intentional uh, design decision on our part to um, have a nice flowing river aesthetic that isn't uh, abruptly interrupted by shifting of the walls. Next slide. And there are, there are two additional uh, or two bridges in between McCarran and Keystone. Uh, there's a cemetery bridge, which as you can see is um, the, the paint's fairly new and it has our corridor colors. So we won't be touching that one as part of this project. It looks good as is. And then there's a Soaker Bridge, which as Aaron mentioned is being widened to the inside. So there'll be some new construction there as well as the existing paint is old and patchy. So we'll be repainting all existing and new concrete surfaces, our corridor colors. So at the end of the day, uh, when this project's completed from the dense urban core of Reno all the way out to Rob Drive, we should have um, all our bridges painted the corridor colors. It should look really nice. Mm -hmm. And that concludes my presentation. You can go to the next slide. And I'm going to open it up to any questions anyone might have. Looks good. Looks very yeah, nice. This, yeah, this is Carla Warninghouse. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I I applaud you for this. Um, you know, as, as someone who moved to the area several years ago, I was really struck by the highway artwork in in Reno and and down to Carson Corridor. It's it's really it, it's it's notable um, that you that you've done this. It it really is quite nice. Um, I had a question about the trees. One, what do you do with the old ones? Do they get mulched or you know, what happens to them? And secondly, um, about the irrigation, is it reclaimed water or how is that handled? So uh, the trees coming out, um, we have the option to mulch. I, I would have to look into that and see if that's a, a, going to be a possible option on this one. We've, we've done it in other projects. Um, I, I, I don't know for sure, and I can get back to you on what the process is going to be uh, for that. But yeah, they, they will be coming out and disposed of and with uh, new trees coming in. As far as the irrigation, um, it's not reclaimed water on this one. It's just regular uh, water. Um, so that'll be the arrangement for this particular project. We're really just updating the capacity. The, the irrigation system is, is kind of undersized and dated. So we're bringing in newer equipment and um, uh, it should actually uh, translate to uh, water savings and that we have a more efficient new irrigation system. Hey, this is uh, James Smelligan. Uh, first, awesome. Really happy to see this being done. Um, as a blind pedestrian, <laughs> I walk under that McCarran Bridge um, quite often. And the erosion is a massive problem because the I can't even tell sometimes. I can't even feel like the the rumble strips, um, you know, for the when you walk out to the street to even know that you're going to walk to the street because it's covered in dirt because um, the erosion problems are there so bad. So I'm glad that's going to be addressed. My question to you is, how is what you're doing now different than what you're than what's already there? I mean, I realize that the plant life. Is not in good shape but it looks like they try to use plants which didn't succeed as a measure for erosion control it, how are you really going to keep that dirt from pouring down because it's a big problem i mean is there going to be a lip or a small retaining wall or something to hold the, the dirt so we'll be reinforcing uh these slopes with decorative rock uh, been coordinating with our hydraulics department to make sure that they will hold that slope and not let any more stuff off. So although plants and living plant material is a part of the erosion control, the the real holder is going to be this decorative rock we're installing. And you'll you'll uh, you'll see a noticeable difference when the project's complete because right now the the uh, ground material isn't uh, isn't a large enough size and it isn't a, a type of um, rock that's gonna that's gonna hold. And that's that's why we've been seeing that sloughing. So uh, we will be having larger rock go in. It's angular, it locks into place, and um, that's going to hold down that slope. And it'll be coming down all the way down to the sidewalk. Fantastic. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Madam Vice Chair, two things to note. The first one is that member wager has been with us for a bit to note for the record. And you do have public comment from Emily Montan at this time. Right, okay. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation, Matthew. I appreciate it. Um, having worked in the contracts department for the University of California, I just, I have a question related to that and then something about the flora and fauna. Um, what's the term of RHB's contract in terms of when, when they are supposed to be finished? Uh, Aaron, so, do you happen to know that? Yeah, so the contractor has 300 days after the notice to proceed to complete the project. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Now, um, I heard that you're going to be using water, not captured water for the, for the plants. How are we get? are you guys going to maintain, I'm sorry, is the Department of Transportation going to maintain the plants? Because sometimes even though you watered them, like they get too big, especially the evergreens, mm -hmm. are they going to be trimmed? That kind of stuff. And, and, um, are, and then the other question related to the plants is are all of them all of them native plants? Uh, great questions. So uh, during the process of construction, the contract will be doing the maintenance, and then uh, once we've reached completion, NDOT will pick up main maintenance for uh, the remainder of the time for maintaining the plant material. Okay. The plant material themselves, um, they're not all native. Uh, some of them are uh, regionally adapted uh, uh, plant uh, material. So um, uh, we, we won't sometimes, especially with intersections that are in uh, high visibility, uh, high traffic areas, uh, through our corridor plans, we have a, a set of predetermined uh, plant pallets we generally stick to more or less that um, based off the location of where a project is, we have like a, a different types of plant pallets. So when you get into more remote rural areas, you'll see a stick with purely natives. And then as we get into more urbanized locations, um, where there's more of a need for an ornamental look, then we, we go with, um, you know, we'll still have natives, but we also bring in some uh, ornamental, regionally adapted plant material. And, and the, orna the yeah, the ornamental plants, um, they're not going to uh, interfere with the ecosystem, I assume? No, no, no. Yeah, we, we definitely look in that one. Um, selecting plants, uh, we stay away from all invasive species okay. and mutant species. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank you again for the presentation. No, certainly, thank you. All right, Madam Vice Chair, if there are no further questions from the board, we can say thank you to NDOT and then transition on to our next item. Development projects. Yes, ma'am. Item C1 tonight is Viewpoint Apartments Access Road. And at this time, we will move over the panelist, who is the representative on this item. I believe it's Dave Snellgrove. He'll be rejoining us. And once he does, he's free to unmute and start the presentation. Good evening, for the record. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. If you'll just let us know when you want us to advance your slides, we'll take care yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's some animation in it, too. So there will be a few slides that we got to hit a few times. So I apologize for that in advance. Um, <clears throat> for the record, I'm Dave Snellgrove. Um, Bob Skiff is also on the, on the call tonight. If at a point we need to bring him up, if there's any questions, or you might be able to promote him right now, just in case there's anything he wants to fill in. He's the project manager working with the applicant. Um, more directly than I, but uh, I'll go through the presentation. This is a second emergency access road. We we got the viewpoint apartment project approved a couple of years ago. Um, we're working on the plans for that, and we also had a a new access road that got approved. And we've been working with staff and working with the fire department in terms of not only a first access, which I'll show you where that is, first emergency access, but they wanted to have a second emergency access to this this site just in the way it, way it was built, or I, I can argue not built over time. If you can advance to the next slide, please. 
So what this site shows is the Montebello apartment complex, which is just above Chalk Bluff, um, south of I-80 and west of uh, McCarran Boulevard. The overall site for the Montebello project, their parcel is over 54 acres. The development site is shown in the little orange uh, highlighted or orange outlined area down in the bottom right hand corner of that blue. Yes, where the handy went. And that's a total of 0.57 acres of the site. What this will be is an emergency access route that would come out and link in with the route, route that comes down from uh, Summit Ridge Drive as, a, as another possible way out. The a fire department, when looking at this, were concerned. They were concerned about the intersection of Summit Ridge Drive going into the Montebello apartments. If something were to happen there, that they needed to have appropriate access alternatively that wouldn't count on that choke point. <clears throat> so we've submitted for a major site plan review, and all this would be is for fills on the site that were exceeding the 10 foot of fill limitation and part of the property. Uh, so I said it was 0.57 acres in total disturbance area. We've got about 5,436 uh, square feet of land that will be, exceed that 10 foot of fill or greater. Can you advance to the next slide, please? So out of this, the there was a uh, the conditions of approval on the uh, viewpoint apartment site. And I've highlighted number six here that identifies that part of the issuance and we we changed this over time rather than being at certificate of occupancy we took it to a uh, building permit for vertical construction so it it has to this has to come a little bit earlier that we shall provide an emergency secondary access subject to the satisfaction of the administrator we've been working closely uh, we worked with Trey Palmer when he was still at uh, the city of Reno and we've been working with John Beck and also the community development staff in terms of the location of this next slide please so this shows the property zoning the property is zoned MF14 um, we're not proposing any new buildings or anything all this will be is an emergency access road um, an emergency access route that'll go out, as I mentioned before. Next slide, please. This is the previously approved plan. This was actually called Oasis the Bluffs back in uh, 1995. And what happened when that was approved is the phase one, the Montebello apartments by what they're called now was constructed, but that second phase was never completed. It was graded. There were dry utilities put in the ground, uh, but it, it was never completed. So it created kind of a challenge in terms of the access. Um, you can see up in the on the left hand or right hand side of the image, there's a dual access road that comes into the site. Yes, there. That is called a median separated dual access. And up until probably about 15 years ago. That was very acceptable per fire code to handle both primary and secondary access. Well, over time, codes have changed, and that made this site a little bit more challenging in terms of how we get access in and out of not only, well, the front part and the back part. The back part, I'll say, is phase two, what we have approved right now, but we've got to get the access uh, fully handled to the satisfaction of the fire department. So we are working on that. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the same general image, just in an aerial form, and shows, you can see that median separated dual access. And you can see that the grading was done on the uh, viewpoint site, which was the second phase of the, the old 1995 approved map, but was never completed. You can see that there's a pattern there, and that was done quite a number of years ago, but it was never constructed. And directly to the south of us is the Chalk Bluff uh, Water Treatment Facility. To the north is I-80. Next slide, please. So now this was where animation was supposed to be to bring each of them up. So the blue, the blue line there, that is a access road that'll serve as the primary access into the viewpoint apartments. The green arrows signify that you could still access through. They'll be gated going between Montebello and Viewpoint, but that would provide another point of access. And then we have the 
Uh, it's a weird color. Yeah, that one. Thank you. <laughs> the the reddish one. That is an emergency access point that we previously had approved with the access road. And the fire department wanted yet another access point. So the, where the purple arrow is that kind of goes off of the map, that's where this new access point is. So we've got two emergency accesses, and then we've got the viewpoint access or the blue line that'll serve day-to-day -day traffic in and out of the viewpoint apartments. And there is still yet another access that would go through the Montebello apartments. Next slide, please. So this shows the grading plan and what we've done is colored just in green. We don't have a landscape plan with this. And, and the intention of that is we don't really want to call this route out. It's not intended to be a day-to-day -day access. It doesn't have pedestrian sidewalk or anything on it. It's intended to be an emergency access. There will be an emergency gate on both ends of the, of the access road. Um, and it'll get used in case of an emergency. And I really hope it never has to be used that we don't have that type of emergency. If you look up to the north, if you can move your arrow up, there's that first emergency access road, just, yep, yeah, right there. That's where the first one was previously approved. And they wanted to have another one for, for appropriate flow and maybe some separation of emergency vehicles coming in and people getting out if they were in that situation where it needed to do an evacuation. Next slide, please. This next slide is a cut and fill map. So on this map, the green and the pink areas, those are the areas that exceed the 10 feet. That's that 5,400 plus or minus square feet that we do exceed the thresholds necessitating a, uh, a major site plan review. This will go to planning commission and have to be reviewed there. Uh, but that is the area that does break the threshold. Next slide, please. So with some views coming down, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a yellow line on the on the photo on the left because really a lot of this road will be behind that ridge and it'll marry in with the with the road as you come down. On the front end, this is viewing from a, a sewer act or yeah, it's a sewer access road that runs next to Chalk Bluff. That fence that you can see in the foreground is the Chalk Bluff fencing. And the road will approximately be running there. So we're coming down and having to get onto that side slope, which means we have to fill that area in. The intention is by not providing formal landscape and just providing revegetation, our hope is, is this will come back and look more natural and won't be really this highly visible thing that people wonder, oh, what's that? There's a, there's a route. We'd like for people not to be interested in going up and down it. Um, I guess pedestrians could walk up and down if it supplies a shorter route. I have a fire access road near my house and people walk their dogs all the time on it. But um, in terms of any vehicular traffic, that is not the intent. And we're trying to make this look as natural as possible while we do have to have this element in the project. Next slide, please. So this is just some general development stats we've gone over the total property size, 54 plus acres, the development area itself where we're gonna have some scarring is 0.57 acres, which is about 1% of the site. And then we've got, um, that shouldn't, yeah, we've got 0.11 acres, which is 5,436 uh, square feet of the site exceeds that threshold of uh, 10 foot of fill. Next slide, please, which I think is my closing slide. So with that, close my presentation and be available for any questions. I don't hear any questions. Madam Vice Chair, I do see that you have public comment from Cheyenne Sauter, if you'd like to take that at this time. Please. Hi there, um, I'm Cheyenne Sauter from AHA Projects. I'm, I may have missed it in the presentation, but was there, what's the housing makeup? Is it um, working class housing, affordable housing? Mm -hmm. um, is there a percentage going to affordable housing? If you could Actually, the, the, the project that we have before you is simply and solely for an emergency access route that mm -hmm. it will tie in and serve a previously approved apartment project, which was the extension of 
uh, project that was approved back in 1995 okay. and the completion of where Montebello apartments are, it'll be the end of that, the end of that peninsula. Um, with that, it'll be market rate housing. Um, we didn't have any, any uh, affordable housing component in that project when it went through the approval a couple of years ago. Okay, thank you for sharing. You're welcome. With that, Madam Vice Chair, I don't see any other public comment at this time. So returning it back to board for questions. I don't think there's any. Okay, with that, then uh, we will say thank you to Dave. Thank and you, have a great night. Thank you, transitioning Thanks. Madam Vice Chair to item D. These are committee member reports and announcements. I'm not aware of any, but if anybody else is, please jump in. I don't have anything. No, no real announcements. No. All right, Madam Vice Chair, transitioning to future agenda items. Well, I think there's going to be a lot of activity starting this Wednesday, so I'm Sure, there'll be something to talk about at that point. Carla, did you want to bring something? Yeah. You had emailed me. So yeah, maybe. I, sure. I had I had a couple of concerns, um, and maybe they can be addressed in the in the future. Um, you know, one was just trying to understand the planning commissions. I guess under um, their their approach to you know all these infill projects, which you know I understand we're trying to balance. Um, the developers concerns you know and their their cost analyses and 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 so forth and, and fit more people in but you know it really is distressing for many folks in these old areas with lots of single family small houses to now have these gigantic you know buildings going up next to them that are you know three times the height of the surrounding homes and i'm, I'm just trying to under, understand how their what their approach to that is and you know, another concern that I had was about um, planning for electric vehicle charging. Um, you know, it is the wave of the future. And, um, you know, is the city, how is the city dealing with that? I, I just was reading something uh, about two weeks ago in the San Francisco paper, you know, about, um, you know, trying to have like on street charging and, you know, so forth. How are we going to deal with that? Plus accommodated in residences. I pointed out in my email to you that there are, you know, lots of homes that don't have driveways, you know, largely because the lots were split in the back is now another house where the garage used to be and so forth. So there's really not great options for them unless they can get authorization to put parking right next to the house where they have an outlet. And currently that's not allowed in many areas to build that sort of you know, parking pad um, next to your house. I think that's something that's got to be um, ideally changed or at least, you know, dealt with. Um, so those those were those were my concerns, uh, primarily that. Um, I'm just curious, I mean, and, and hopefully Jenny will have more information than me. Um, my neighborhood is an older neighborhood and it's single family homes. And we found out that we had CCNRs that were done in 1972, I believe, and this, the constructions, I didn't own it then, of course, and the construction started in 72. And so I would always recommend that you check with um, the assessor's office to see if you do have any kind of restrictions because in your area, because what I was told when I checked into our area, we definitely have them. Um, but they, they've, they was told they go back to like the 1800s. So older neighborhoods may have these restrictions. And unfortunately, and I, you know, I've been a big, I've been a big deal on this one. Every time I go to the city council is that we need to have notice and we need to have information and you can't just say, I'm going to put you know, I'm good. we're going to put these restrictions in this area without seeing if it's appropriate, because if you have restrictions, they're in perpetuity. 
So it would lead to litigation, et cetera. So I'm hoping that the city will actually now start looking into that or at least telling the property owners where they're trying to build to check that out. You know, I think that's an excellent point, Margo, and something that, you know, I I have discovered a lot of these sort of restrictions, you know, after the fact. And, you know, to to um, Councilwoman Breck, is, you know, one question I have is, are these things truly, you know, in perpetuity? I mean, forever and ever, as populations change, as, you know, people's needs change, is there really no way to now have have rules change so that, that they work for the people that actually live there? I mean, how does how is that handled? Well, you really yeah. just need to check and see if there's CCNRs or covenants and restrictions or whatever is in your hood. And it wasn't that difficult. I just called the title company. They gave me that there was, there were, in fact, we had a person move in two years ago and they were still in effect. And they will be in effect because in our particular setting, you have to have 75% of the, the, the neighbors want to change it. Well, I don't mean this in a bad way. I don't think half of the neighbors knew they were there until we went and talked to everybody. Yeah. I mean, I, I think STOP will be coming back, ADU ordinance, and that's where that came up in terms of land use zoning. But um, covenants that are probably pre-1966 or so, 1960, predate zoning, um, you know, but then zoning can come in as a government you know, power that can come in afterward and the ADU ordinance is an iteration of that. I've always learned that um, CCRs do expire if not enforced over time, but I, I don't know what the case law in Nevada had. And, case law is um, pretty I, clear. If you have a covenant that runs with the land, it's in perpetuity. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think the covenant I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think checked that, with three lawyers and I'm not a property attorney. So they just, yeah, that they thought they were mad at me yeah. saying, you don't have to call us anymore. That's how it works. Yeah. And I think what we did is um, this, the discussion with staff was that it would be an administrative tool and hopefully they will show a demonstration of that, how they will administratively, um, you know, outline um, you know, this is zoning. This is what zoning allows. Covenants are usually in a, you know, can be in effect, may be in effect, are often in effect. Really, they're more specific and more contemporary developments. And then staff will um, have applicants check off whether or not they, um, their understanding is that covenants restrict or um, allow or disallow what they're asking to do, which would be an ADU. So, so the application comes in and the, um, the property owner has to attest to whether or not um, they are allowed under CCNRs to do that. And then it would be up to neighbors to be able to um, enforce those if they believe otherwise than what- well, That's what I'm saying. If your neighbor's yeah. gonna build something and they don't tell you about it, good luck. Right now, I mean, I can tell you for my hood, and it's not a real yeah. big one. It's been in effect since 1972. And like I said, a neighbor just two years ago had to comply with with those CCs and R's with when he was doing the when purchasing the home because there's covenants that run with the land. And if you if your land isn't free and clear, you gotta follow it. Yeah. You had to sign off on it. That's how it works. Yeah. Well, I think staff is working with the attorneys to kind of get that that right. And, and there's so much variation between CCNRs. Some CCNRs this are very integrated into the original development approval. And so, you know, even their, their private agreements, we have a stake in them. We mandated them. And sometimes we even go up to the CCNR board um, before we approve a development. Some are very antiquated and predated zoning. And that's more like what you're talking about, Margo. So staff is working on a catch-all to capture all of those scenarios. Well, and, yeah. there's a big difference, uh, Jenny. I mean, if, in ours, it says it's there and it's only for single family homes. And you can only have them two, two stories, I think, and yeah. a garage, et cetera, et cetera. And some of the lots yeah. are small and some of them are big. 
Yeah. I mean, my educational training and, you know, professional practice is case studies. So if I was the staff member and I heard someone like you say that, Margo, I would say, okay, I want to pull yours. I want to have um, the city yeah, attorney look at them. them. They're on and file. Then, yeah, They're yeah, I would do a case study and say, look, we found one in Southwest Reno that we're not sure. It, it, it would inform the process. And, um, you know, those are the kind of the points that I've been making. And we can make, you know, y'all can make again as they move forward. I think originally on the ADU ordinance, they came forward for next summer. And I think I made the motion and said, let's try and get it next spring. But they're going to continue to, I think they're making stops at all the NABs, probably before I leave the board. So, um, you know, you know, remember that when they come forward, um, well, like I said, it's, do a it's case certain... study. Here's mine, guys. Take a case study. Do a case study. It's not, I'm not asking you to do something free for me. I'm asking you to go and do a little deeper dive. And well, um, we, we yeah. checked with the vast majority of our neighbors and nobody wanted that system. They wanted the CCNRs to control and that's how it is. And of course, it's pretty yeah. loose. I mean, I'm yeah. afraid to admit yeah, what I always heard is, you know, you may have 10 other procedures in there. For example, you know, that and our, the legislature got rid of the racist covenants, you know, right. recently. And they might, was point in the to, 60s. Uh, ten, they might point to 10 other things and say, well, you're supposed to have a board. You're supposed to have an annual meeting. These are toast because everything else, nothing yeah, else. They has didn't been in say effect. that in ours. Yeah. They just said there they are. Yeah. And you know, and it's not a huge area. I mean, that's another thing. It's it's not a planned development like a lot of the areas are yeah. today. Yeah, but it is. It is an area that they put in constrict construction. I mean, const, um, okay. what do they call them? See, uh, they call them covenants. Uh, covenants that and run with the land. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would. Um, like I said, that's how I would do it if I was the staff planner. I'd made those comments because I've heard from enough folks in these old neighbors hoods who. Who'd you raise the question? Well, you know what you can do. I mean, if you own the land, you can put in a storage unit. You can put in a mother-in-law's quarter. I mean, it's your land. Um, you can do that, but you can't. You can't do it without notice and other things that go along with the building codes. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I wouldn't recommend putting this on the next agenda because I think staff is coming forward with it pretty soon. I would assume um, so. Yeah. And you know what? Um, if you're interested, I would encourage you. It's been a minute and the website is really out to date, but they might have an up to date website on that. And you could reach out to them because they they were doing a good job at one point, letting people know where they're at on some of these large policy changes. Well, when I was there and I was at all of the hearings, the it came out that if there are covenants and restrictions that are on the property, they they take priority under the hunt. Yeah. Yeah. Launches survey. The last update I see here is survey. So not much going on. Maybe staff could uh, kind of next time bring an update on where they're at because they're out of date on the website. All right, Madam Vice Chair, if there is nothing further from the board, we'll transition to closing public comment. If anyone would like to give closing public comment at this time, please raise your hand. Madam Vice Chair, seeing none at this time, we would be transitioning to adjournment. We'd be looking for a possible motion. This is Carla Warninghouse. I move that we adjourn. Second. All in favor? Bye. 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 Thank no you, everyone. Me. See you next Thank time. You. Next Thank time, you. can we try and get it in person, please? Yeah. <laughs>